Daniel Martin is not a politician. He's a patriot. He is a first-generation American, a student of Austrian economic theory, and a freedom paramour currently working for the Hewlett-Packard as a mobile technical engineer. Manuel believes strongly in the Constitution and our nation's heritage, propounding that it is imperative that we embrace the Founders' idea of the proper role of, for government in a free society is to protect life, liberty, and property. Martin is not running for Assembly District 9 because he wants to. He feels compelled to. Everyone, please welcome Mr. Manuel Martin. Time out of your afternoon to come uh, listen to some politicians speak. I know that might not be the most fun thing in the world, uh, but like my introduction was saying, um, I do work for Hewlett Packard as a field tech engineer. What that means is I fix printers, computers, and and everything in between. So it's, it's a lot of fun, and I've been doing that for about a year and a half. So it's a good job. I was born in Lodi. Uh, raised on my grandfather's dairy. I started working at the age of 12 years old on the dairy. I told my grandpa that I wanted to make some money. So he put me in this big old gigantic tractor and said, here you go, you know, go work. So I started working because like most kids, I wanted, I wanted to be able to buy things. And my dad was not the type of dad to just give me handouts. You know, when we go out to eat pizza, I get one quarter to go buy a gumball. If I wanted anything else, I'd have to work. Now at that age, I was lucky that I had the opportunity to work, and so I took advantage of that. I worked on the farm till the age of 21. While I was there, I started a jelly company. I made pomegranate jelly. I had a pomegranate Merlot jelly, a pomegranate jelly, and a pomegranate strawberry marmalade. I was in Whole Foods and Food for Less about maybe at any given time, 12 or a little bit more stores. So that was a good learning experience. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have ever done business with a grocery store, but it will definitely teach you a lot, that dynamic. And especially since I started from scratch and I knew nothing about making jelly. So it was a large learning curve, but uh, I saw a niche in a market and that was pomegranate jelly and, and nobody had it. So I tried to take advantage of it. Um, I gave that up, I was being a little entrepreneur. I, I gave that up to go back to school, got a degree in business management. And that about that time is when Obamacare was getting passed. And I saw the way it was getting passed through a lame duck Congress, a 2,000 page bill that nobody was reading. And I just thought there was something fundamentally un-American about that. It's just not right that your Congress can pass a 2,000 page bill during a lame duck Congress and even though that the switchboard was melting down and there were hundreds of thousands of calls coming in every single week, they just ignored you. And that is not how a representative republic is supposed to work. And there's something wrong there. So with, with the implementation of Obamacare, I got really passionate. I started reading a lot of history. I started reading a lot of economics. And I just, the more I read, the more I learned, the more I realized this country is not functioning how it was designed to function. There's a disconnect between how our founding fathers established this nation and how we are governing today. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about me. I want to talk a little bit about my full-time representation plan. And what this does is this learns from how our founding fathers established our government and we put some of those principles here in California. See the Constitution was not designed to keep government and control government because after all what is government? It's a collection of people. The Constitution was designed to control your representatives that you send to Washington. So the question I ask you is what restraints do we have on our representatives here in Sacramento? None. The Constitution enacted restraints on our representatives in Congress, but nothing here. So my full-time representation plan, there's a couple of planks. One, I want them to work the first two weeks of the month and the last two weeks they spend in the district. This will give them time to be in Sacramento and then time to be home, living in the district and on a continuing basis. Whereas now they're up there seven months, they get paid way too much money, and then they come home and they lobby. Then they go back for seven months and they stay secluded from the people. So what my plan does is it gives them an opportunity to be home every two weeks, living underneath and within the laws that they create. Another thing, I want to reduce their salary to $60,000 a year. Uh, it's about what the average California working household brings in is $60,000 a year. And I feel like if you're going to represent the people, then you shouldn't make three times what they make. Right now, when you include their per diem, it's about 130 grand a year. Uh, I, I feel like if you want to make $130,000 a year, get a job in the private sector. Don't go live off of the taxpayer and call it public service. That's how I feel. 
Um, and another thing that is that's really integral to this state, many other states do it, Texas does it, for example. This state needs to start passing a two-year budget. And this is integral for our economy. If we have a two-year budget, businesses will be able to project into the future what the, what the taxes are going to look like, what the regulatory environment is going to look like. And then with this, with this ability to see what their government is doing, they can project their resources and decide, are we going to invest here? Are we going to invest there? Are we going to actually hire people? Now, when we give the, the private sector the ability to project, it will be beneficial for our economy and hopefully the private sector will be able to allocate resources wisely and not have to worry about what the uh, benevolent politicians are doing in Sacramento. That's a couple of, of planks of my uh, full-time representation plan. Um, another thing that is integral and especially in this state is the size of our assembly districts. In California we have the largest assembly sized districts in the nation by more than, well, Okay, the second place state. How, how large do you think the districts are in the second place state? Second, second largest? I want to guess. Somebody's got to guess. We're at 465,000 constituents. What do you think the second place state is? 250? That's a good guess. So Texas has the second largest assembly size districts at 167,000 constituents. So nobody is at 175,000, nobody's in 200,000s, nobody's in the 300,000s, and we're almost at 500,000 constituents per assembly representative. This, my friends, is a lack of representation. The fewer politicians there are, the less your vote matters. The fewer politicians there are, the more powerful each politician becomes. So in Texas, where you have 167,000 constituents per representative, you have about three times the representation in Texas than you do here. And Texas is the second worst. There's a problem with that. Nationwide, the average assembly size district is 51,000 constituents. Here in California, you have nine times worse representation than the average, average constituent throughout the United States. This is something that needs to be addressed. So under my plan, I want to reduce the size of assembly districts in half. I want to cut it in half to 232,000. This is a bold step by actually cutting it in half, but unfortunately, this is just the first step. It's kind of like just putting one toe in front of the other, because we still have the worst representation in the nation. So this is a little bit about my uh, full-time representation plan. Um, you know, if you want to help take the money out of politics without passing some sort of draconian law that takes away people's ability to exercise their, their ability to own property, which is money, money's property, and without restricting people's ability to give money to candidates, the way to take money out of politics is to shrink the size of the district. In North Dakota, the assembly race that raised the most amount of money, they only raised $16,000 and they lost. In small districts, which in North Dakota they have 8,000 constituents per representative, in small districts people don't trust the politician who comes in and spends you know four or five times the amount of the average representative. In California the district that spent the most amount of money, assembly district, spent eight million. Eight million to sixteen thousand. Now the question I want to ask you, when it costs seven hundred thousand or a million dollars to run for assembly, is that truly a citizen legislature? It's not. When you're one out of 465,000 voters, are you really being represented? I think not. When you have 80 assembly members representing 38 million people, is that, is that a representative republic or an oligarchy? Oligarchy being defined as government by the few, for the few, off the backs of the many. That's my little impromptu. Um, so I think this really needs to be addressed. We, we do need to shrink the size of the districts and it's going to make your politician more accountable. Uh, another thing that needs to happen, and ten, uh, 10 other states do it, 10 states limit the amount of bills each representative can propose to 10 or less. It's very common practice. If you give your representatives an unlimited amount of bills they can propose, what's, what's going to stop them and hold them accountable to you? So in California, we have, we have limitations. Each assembly member can propose 50 bills, and each senator can propose 65. There's some limitations, which is 6,600 a year. So the question I want to ask you is, how many bills does your legislature need to pass every single year to secure your life, liberty, and property? Very few, right? I doubt it takes 6,000 bills. So under my plan, I want to give each representative five bills each. 
for a grand total of a thousand bills every two years. I think this is perfectly acceptable. And I think it's definitely enough bills to uh, take care of the state's business. And when you have smaller district and you limit the amount of bills they can propose, you got to ask yourself, are they going to waste that bill on a lobbyist? Or are they going to use that bill to benefit the people? They only have five. So we, just as the Constitution puts restraints on our representatives to benefit you, we need to put some restraints on our legislature here in Sacramento to benefit you. So that's what my full-time representation plan calls for. When I'm elected, I'm going to use the power of my office to travel up and down the state and raise money to get this on the ballot. Obviously, the politicians in Sacramento will not vote for it, uh, so we're going to try to get it on the ballot, and it's going to take a lot of work. But also, it's, it's going to be worth it. The people in California are rising up. They're, try, they're starting to realize this problem of lack of representation. Another thing that I'm really passionate about is uh, we, I think we need some regulation reform in this state. And I have a very simple proposal. Any economic regulation that a state agency wants to enact, that state agency needs to have a representative carry that regulation in the form of a bill. It needs to be voted on in the legislature, up or down, and sent to the governor. In this state, we have regulation without representation, as well as taxation without representation, because they can enact fees. So I want to I want to take that power and give it back to the people. A state agency would then have to petition a representative to carry that bill, and then your representatives will now vote on it, versus some unelected bureaucrat telling you how to live your life. Um, those are a couple of things that, that I'm really passionate about. I'm also really passionate about education. Um, I know Igor's intern over there is really passionate about Common Core. Uh, I'm really passionate about Common Core. Uh, I don't know if you guys know anything about Common Core. It's a uh, national directive coming from, from the federal government. Our state legislature never voted on it. Congress never voted on it. Our governor just pushed it through. It's going to cost this state $2 billion to implement. It's lowering math standards. It's lowering English standards. And it's really just not good for our kids. I think California needs to start asserting its constitutional rights and keep education local. The fact is, um, you, the Constitution never gave the federal government the ability to to get involved in education. There's a very good reason for that. Would you want to have one top-down system where if something goes wrong, all of the children in the United States suffer? Or would you rather have 50 states of individual educational innovation in which what, what one state does right, another state can copy? Or if one state suffers, then the other 49 just won't implement that. And then that state will catch on and get rid of whatever curriculum was harming their students. So Common Core is a top-down initiative. I want to get rid of that, and quite frankly, I think at this time, the only way to stop it is through the legislature. Uh, I don't think school boards really have the authority to do it anymore, which is rather sad. So those are a couple of things I'm passionate about. Um, I'm a huge student, huge student of economics, huge student of history, and I realize that what made America great was not the ability for you to go out and have five different grocery stores to shop at. What made America great was you having the ability to start that sixth grocery store and be competitive and tell the consumers, hey, come look at my product. Come look, come look at my customer service, and you're going to like my store. I think in this state we need, less regu we need a, a smaller regulatory environment. We need a smart legislature. You all need to, to call out and say, we need you representatives to impose some restrictions to benefit us. And that's what I'm doing. You're not going to see a politician here in Sacramento that wants to shrink the size of the representatives. Because if you shrink the size, I mean, sorry, shrink the size of the district. If you shrink the size of the district, what are you effectively doing to that representative? You're cutting his or her power. If I'm representing 200,000 constituents versus 400,000 constituents, I'm now half as powerful. And I'm okay with that. Because I'm not in this for power. I'm in this to represent you, and I'm in this to protect your life, liberty, and property. So with that being said, I would like to take a couple of questions. Nobody has any questions. This is Young Americans for Liberty. Come on. I know you guys have questions. No? OK. Well, then I have one simple little exercise. So Igor Berman's campaign is buying pizza. And I figured I'd do something a little innovative. So I have some books here. I'm not giving these books away, because I love these books. <laughs> but there's something that's going to go along with these books. So after 
the person who's read the most amount of these will get a little gift that I have. So who's read Orwell's 1984? Okay, good. Now, if you've read all, all of these, then keep your hand up. So, economics in one lesson. Nobody's read... <laughs> Are you serious? Hazlitt's? Oh, wow, okay. All right. Hayek's Constitution of Liberty. Two? Two? One and a half? Okay. Okay. The Fruits of Graft, The Great Depression, and Now? No? No? Okay. So did you raise your hand twice? Or just what? Twice? Twice? Okay, so you're winning. Rothbard's America's Great Depression? Rothbard? Okay, okay. <laughs> all right, all right. Frederick Bastiat's The Law. Okay, this is his entire collection. But The Law? All right, okay. So you guys are tied? You guys are tied, all right. Federalist Papers. All of it? Okay, okay, so then you're the winner. And this is what you win. This is not a normal quarter. This is a 1957 quarter. What makes that quarter special? Yeah, it's 90% silver. So it's worth about four bucks. And it's shiny. It's a full weight quarter. It hasn't been shaved down. So um, I hope you guys realize that I'm in this for one reason. That's to protect your life, liberty, and property. To make sure that when you guys graduate, graduate from college, you have a vibrant economy to go out to and get a job. And um, I have my sign-up sheets. I, I hope you guys all sign up. We're going to need a lot of volunteers this year. 2014 is going to be a good year for Republicans, especially Republicans who aren't afraid to stand for freedom um, and, and economic liberty. And so uh, we're going to be passing around my sign-up sheets. If you guys could sign up, give me information. We'll keep you in contact with the campaign. And um, I look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you.